Good morning to everyone in the United States and North America. Uh, good afternoon to folks in Europe and a welcome to everyone around the world uh, joining us today for this webinar. I'm Jeff Rathke, the president of the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies at Johns Hopkins University. And uh, you know, every webinar is a delight, but this one's a special delight, I would say. Uh, I think we've got an extremely timely uh, topic and, and excellent uh, contributors. So uh, my job really is to move things along and get myself out of the way. Uh, so let me just uh, tell you, first of all, um, the reason we're here, uh, we're here to talk about transatlantic security strategies. Um, in particular, we've of course been gripped in the transatlantic community by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, which has raised the most difficult security challenges for uh, the United States and its European partners and allies in the last 40 years or so. And uh, this of course has demands for us in the moment um, and in the coming months, but it also requires a reassessment of the assumptions we've made about European security and about our strategies as we look ahead uh, for, the, for the years to come. This uh, of course places a heavy emphasis on the role of Germany, uh, the, the country that we focus on most directly here at AICGS, but of course it has implications in a much wider context. The United States, um, the uh, countries in Central and Eastern Europe who are most closely uh, exposed to Russian aggression and the impact of the war at the moment, but of course for Europe as a whole. And so we've assembled a, a tremendous group of, of people. Um, I'm going to do a very short introduction of them and then we will get right into uh, the conversation. Um, I will do this uh, sort of in reverse um, speaking order. Uh, Daniel Fiat, Dr. Daniel Fiat is the security and defense editor of the European Union Institute for Security Studies, the EU ISS. Um, he joins us uh, from Brussels, I believe, Daniel, is that right? Um, Justina Gotkowska is uh, from the Center for Eastern Studies based in Warsaw. She is an expert in German foreign and security uh, policy uh, and will bring us perspectives from the eastern flank of uh, the European Union and the NATO alliance. Heather Conley is the president of the German Marshall Fund of the United States, a position she has held um, for the last few months after leading for many years the Europe and Eurasia program uh, at the Center for Strategic and International Studies here in Washington. And um, our first speaker and uh, where we're going to start is Ambassador Christoph Hoisman. He's the chairman of the Munich Security Conference uh, I think well known um, uh, to all of you uh, out there, uh, of course, was the German ambassador to the United Nations. And before that, for about a dozen years, was the top foreign policy advisor to German Chancellor Merkel. So um, thanks to all of you for, uh, for being here. Uh, Christoph Hoiskin, I, I will start by uh, pointing out a, an article you published in the magazine Der Spiegel recently. I don't know if it's available in English yet, but uh, I hope they will translate it if they haven't already. Um, but in it, you, you described the Russian invasion as a watershed moment, not just for Russia and NATO, but uh, specifically for Germany. Um, and in particular, um, you, you called this, I think, the third new beginning um, for the Federal Republic of Germany. Uh, what is it that characterizes this third phase for, uh, for modern Germany, in your view? The typical mistake that I forget to unmute. Um, Jeff, first of all, thank you very much for, for having me and, and um, uh, thanks for including me on this wonderful um, podium here. It's my, my pleasure to, to work with you. For those who uh, don't uh, know our relationship, we go back to when uh, Jeff was still in the kindergarten and he spent that in the um, US Embassy in, in Berlin under um, Tim, and Mr. Ambassador Timken, I believe. Um, that was um, basically almost the last That's summer. right. Yes. Um, and wonderful to be included here. Um, yes. Um, you know, when you talk about this, and, and uh, it's not translated, I don't know if it will be, but it's, uh, I talk about three watersheds. So first one was 
Um, you know, 1949, after the Second World War, Germany was accepted again into the unity, in the alliance of, of, of free nations. Um, the Allies watched over us, uh, defended us, US in particular, defended us against Russian blackmail, the Berlin um, <laughs> air bridge. And, um, um, you know, and, and we were allowed to enter NATO and EU. So we were, and then the second phase was 89, uh, reunification. And um, this was a phase where, again, I think to a large degree to how Germany behaved through the first phase that our neighbors were happy to have uh, reunification again. It was very much um, um, George Bush um, senior was um, kind of the, the, the ally um, that was um, actually going ahead and, and um, seen to it that we were included. And um, we also, of course, were aware that um, reunification would not have been possible if uh, Russia didn't play ball. A weak Russia at the time, but a Russia that was talking about, you know, perestroika and, and opening. And uh, it was a, a different Russia from what we had today. Watershed third phase. In the second phase, we were established. We, we became reuni reunited. We played our role we took some you know sometimes we took a lead on some crime but basically you know we played um with um, with with uh, with the others um also trying to you know to have a good relationship with russia with china always working on transatlantic relations in the eu and playing kind of middle of the road and i think now with um this um um a breach of civilization, as I always describe it, what Putin is doing, we enter a third phase where Germany cannot um, hide behind anybody else. Um, Germany has to step up to the plate. Germany has to assume responsibility in Europe. Um, also, in in, um, um, in in the you know we have to be a, a player transatlantic. Alliance, we have to also go out. And um, you mentioned that I was member that was um, uh, in representing Germany at the UN. I was two years in the Security Council, and um, I could see the. Um, this was during the Trump administration. I could see how much the world order is under strain, how much um, disrespect there was for international law. Um, I saw also how Russia, you know, where they have their Wagner, Wagner troops, but also saw where China was taking over um, uh, many countries in Africa, ambassadors reading um, uh, Chinese speaking notes. I saw the influence in Latin America, um, also in, in Asia and some parts. And um, um, and then you know this is my what I what I I wrote in the in the, in the piece that Germany as the fourth. Um, for strongest economic nation, Germany as a country that is the second largest donor for um, uh, development aid, we are the second largest donor um, to the to the um, United Nations as general. Um, we have over over time through our um, uh, policy that we conducted um, you know, since 1949, we have a good reputation worldwide. I have seen it again and again that African ambassadors told me you have to help us, you know, one ambassador, please help me to get the 1000 pound gorilla off my back, meaning China. We have seen Latin America, you know, why don't you do more, you know, can, can't you, um, you know, do what Alexander von Humboldt did in the 19th, in the 18th century, can't you, and, um, you know, ASEAN countries. We have to do more. Um, we have to assume um, uh, more responsibility, and this means that we um, have also to take take the lead on 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 many issues. We will discuss the um, uh, the Russia war, uh, where we have to take the take the lead um, in uh, sanctions. In uh, you know, how do we cooperate? And we have to do it. Another, um, we have to do some homework in Germany. The fact that we still don't have a national security council um, is ridiculous. I find that we still have separate ministry of uh, foreign affairs and a totally separate other party ministry for economic cooperation. This is nothing. Uh, this is, I think, for a good time. But when you have to 
when you're in the middle of the power the structure, you have to you have to change you have to change that you have to become more more active um, on current policy and i want to stop with this chancellor schultz um, has um, um, actually taken up that task um, that was before i wrote the article so he's totally independent he did this on the 27th of february where he gave a watershed um, speech where he um, said that you know we have to turn around 180 80 degrees and we have to spend um, what we always committed to two percent on um on on defense um you know we were lagging behind on all the sanctioned ideas with and and then we are going along we are not there yet but you know i want to be part of this discussion i want to uh, promote this discussion in germany the msc has a um, you know, has a has a good reputation. I want to take the MSC. We call it now um, the expression in German is Zeitenwende, um, watershed kind of. And we want to do go on a Zeitenwende on tour. We'll do the MSC in, in German cities to um, actually bring this message that Germany has to assume responsible to to our to our country women and countrymen. Back yeah. to you. Steph. Well. Um, I, so I want to uh, pick up on that question of responsibility, because it has been present in German foreign policy discourse uh, since 2014 uh, in particular. And, and, and I want to go back to one line in, in your article. Uh, apologies for citing it a second time. But um, assuming more responsibility cannot mean always being the last to do what is necessary. Uh, that's a pretty strong implicit criticism of the German approach, um, uh, can you say more about uh, about how that how that can change? How that co that German conception of fulfilling responsibility um, uh, is going to change, and what that will look like? Well, um, you know, we are we are not there yet. But um, um, to give you the example right now on on um, um, on, on uh, how we deal with water, um, no, when you. Um, listen to politicians in Germany, both from the uh, government and the opposition. Um, you know, when when Russia started to be more aggressive, and then the question were raised: How about now stopping Nord Stream two? How about thinking about excluding Russian banks of SWIFT? How about delivering um, uh, weapons to to Ukraine? The uh, response was: No, we don't do it. Um, and gradually, when others took the lead and the pressure was there, also domestic, and then on all of these fronts, um, Germany um, uh, went dead. Even last week, at the beginning of last week, um, many representatives of the government said, no way that we send heavy weapons to Ukraine. A few days later, Scholz, the, the chancellor, turned around and said, yes, we, we will do it. So I think, um, you know, we, we, we understand the reasons for it. but. As the the most important economic um, um, you know, uh, partner in in Europe, uh, we have to be at the top when it comes to designing the response. I think we have to be there at the top and say these are the different measures. We are ready to do that, and we put this on the table. Um, we can then say, okay, for one reason or another, we may lagging behind on that one, but. We have to take um, the lead together, you know, with partners. But Germany cannot, you know, be the one that, as I, as I write, always, um, always lagging behind. Or I say in another phrase, before we do something, first look who is doing what, left and right. But first, you know, have our have our own uh, own opinion and and drive that drive that forward. Mm -hmm. All right. There's so much that left to talk about, and I'm sure we'll come back to some of these things, including Germany's national security strategy, which will be uh, produced by the government uh, this year. Um, but uh, at this point, I want to turn to Heather Conley. Um, he Heather, the, the vital importance of the NATO alliance and its responsibility for collective defense is clearer now than it's been in a couple of generations. Um, in, in some ways, people might take that to mean NATO needs to go back to basics. Um, it needs to rebuild its military capacity to protect uh, all allies. Um, but in your view, is that the most important priority for NATO um, it, it, from an American perspective as you look to the future? Thanks so much. It's great to be with you. Um, you know, I, I thought Christoph's framing of these eras, the 47 to 49 period, the 1989 period, and now 
uh, the, the, this moment in time, these historic moments really do speak to each of those phases, an incredibly strong and important role for the United States. Uh, and then when NATO was formed in 1949, that incredibly important role for, for security to allow Europe uh, to, to integrate, to grow, to, to enlarge. And again, NATO is always at the center of that because we cannot have stability and prosperity without security. Security. You know, as we as we face the run up to the, the Madrid summit um, at the end of June, beginning of July, again, it'll come on the heels of the G7 summit, which uh, Germany um, is uh, is chairing. This is really going to be an incredibly important moment. Um, and in part because we are waiting to see what that, st that strategic concept, uh, NATO's security strategy looks like. NATO hasn't written one since 2010. And 12 years uh, is too long, obviously, for, for shifts and changes. And the reason that it was delayed is because it's really hard to write a strategy that fits now 30 members. Um, and quite frankly, uh, we could be within a few weeks of welcoming 32 new members, meaning NATO's eastern flank may go from Finland to Turkey uh, as we look at that very important um, uh, collective defense and, and deterrence uh, role. So just really quickly, I think what we're looking for is how NATO, what words it uses uh, regarding Russia. Russia wasn't really even mentioned in 2010. Uh, the European Union was, you know, instituting a modern partnership. The U.S. was in the middle of a, a reset, a U.S. reset uh, with Russia. So this is going to be a completely different formulation. And, and adding China to it, I just want to highlight from a U.S. perspective, if you're looking at at least some of the early framing of the national defense strategy, which the classified version has been submitted. We, we don't have a, an unclassified version yet. We're only working on an interim national security strategy. How does NATO address China? It's going to be very interesting because although we're so focused on, on Ukraine, rightly so, Russia this month, May 9th, what, what announcements Putin uh, may provide um, on Monday. But this is a very big China month for the United States. It's very likely that the Biden administration will release its China strategy, um, where the, the president's traveling to Japan and Korea, and you're seeing that United States trying to pull back and reprioritize China. How will the United States manage uh, both theaters, and what will it demand of its allies to do more in Europe, defense spending, um, and, and more capabilities to deter and defend, and then what will it ask of its allies to do in the Indo-Pacific theater? Those are really, really big questions, but, but Jeff, just to finish, I think it's very clear, uh, a NATO at potentially 32 is a NATO that is shifting east in its thinking. Um, the, those members who have most quickly increased their defense spending are along the eastern flank for understandable reasons. So I think that's going to be part of a very interesting evolution uh, of what the strate strategic concept will, will look like. So lots to discuss uh, when the Alliance produces it. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And so, but, but I want to, you know, you do not envision then any change in the administration's uh, emphasis on the Indo-Pacific. That means not just uh, perhaps some quantitative changes in the levels of European defense spending, but qualitative changes in the uh, division of labor, um, so to speak, a a certainly when it comes to European um, uh, territorial and collective defense? So I think we're really grappling with, and you, you aren't seeing that yet in any of the documents because uh, in some ways, even US strategic documents are behind uh, all of these events. They're, they're still the pacing challenges China. We will deal with Russia in a secondary way. That's what sort of the, the basic uh, unclassified outlines of the national defense strategy. We now have to manage two theaters, but manage them in very different ways. So uh, a strong US military presence clearly in both theaters will be the prominent prominent one in Indo-Pacific, but making sure all of our allies do more and are more capable and putting more forward, uh, not an either or proposition, but Jeff, there's going to be some real resistance about uh, taking NATO farther afield, getting back to those basics that you mentioned, and there's resistance with for some NATO members to strengthen NATO's partnerships with Asia-Pacific partners like Japan, like Australia, like Korea. So I think we're going to see some real, you know, uh, geostrategic strategic 
tuggles within the alliance to say, focus on Russia, defensive of NATO territory. That's the primary goal where you have the U.S. really saying, look, we've got to get back to the Indo-Pacific. This has been a distraction from our core challenge. And they're going to have to find the right balance between the two. One last question to you, Heather, before uh, I move to uh, Justina Kakowska. Um, do you see any chance or any likelihood of a permanent change in the level of US uh, uh, force deployments in Europe? Um, this has always been part of that, uh, that tug of war um, uh, over priorities and how you express them through your, uh, your, your defense posture. You've just put your finger on it, Jeff. This is going to be the tension. This is where US military capabilities are extremely stretched. Um, and this is where I, the conversation gets very difficult in the Pentagon. Uh, what are we prioritizing? How can we manage both of these? This was not envisioned when the Biden administration uh, came forward. So I, I, what you know, my recommendation analytically, we have to, NATO must have a much more strengthened, a thickened eastern flank. Again, Sweden, Finland changed this composition pretty dramatically if they are in fact welcomed into the alliance. Um, but I think we're going to have to go uh, to brigade level. We're going to have to see um, uh, whether we call it permanent or rotation, whatever the word choice is, we are now going to have to uh, prepare for a prolonged period of Russian instability along the flank. We have to stop, start preparing for that. Whether they can make those decisions at Madrid, I don't know, but I think that's where we have to go. Okay. Thanks so much, Heather. Um, now, to our viewers out there, just a reminder, we will use the Q&A function uh, in Zoom, so um, please Think a bit about uh, how you would like to contribute to the conversation, and let me just also remind you, um, your, uh, your contribution is much more likely to be taken if it is concisely formulated and if it is actually a question. So uh, keep that in mind, and we'll look forward to bringing you all in uh, shortly. But let me turn now to uh, Justina Gotkowska. Uh, can you tell us how um, Poland's uh, view of, uh, of the its own role and of the German um, contribution has been changing in recent months as the, the crisis surrounding Russia's pressure, coercion, and now invasion uh, of Ukraine has, uh, has developed. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, first of all, uh, for the invitation to this terrific panel. Um, I would like to note, first of all, that uh, this War is for Poland a watershed moment, uh, uh, as well as for Germany, but but for for uh, but different reasons. For Poland, this change is fundamental, and uh, from Warsaw's perspective, the European security order that has been built after the end of Cold War is gone. The principles uh, that uh, all the principles were violated by Russia: sovereign equality, territorial uh, territorial. Um, uh, integrity, and there is no comeback to uh, the cooperative security with, with Russia as we have practiced that uh, before the war. Uh, and the West needs to take into consideration and to account that Russia is a revisionist power willing to use military means to achieve its political goals. And it's not only about Ukraine, uh, Russia has far reaching goals, it's about uh, undermining the West. It's about undermining Euro-Atlantic uh, security structures. These goals were presented in two draft treaties uh, in December uh, last year uh, by Russian MFA. Uh, and uh, among them is creating a buffer zone uh, with limited uh, sovereignty in Northern Europe and Central Eastern Europe. Um, and uh, we need to take uh, into account uh, that we will face a prolonged instability as Heather Conley uh, talked about uh, in the years to come. And if Russia uh, does not lose this war militarily and if it's not politically and economically um, uh, weakened so that it is not able to rebuild its military in the coming years, we'll see or we might see another war in Europe uh, this time against us when the Kremlin sees a window of opportunity 
uh, to seize uh, with a weaker U.S. possibly engage more in uh, Asia uh, Pacific region. Uh, what are the conclusions for security uh, and defense uh, from Polish perspectives? Um, perspective from the actions uh, taken by the major uh, Western allies uh, so far. I think that Poland has seen a very strong uh, Pol uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, axis. This is U.S., U.K., Canada that understands what is at stake um, in with regard to. European security along with the Eastern Flank countries. And this has been reflected uh, in um, these countries' political, military and economic support to Ukraine, but also heavy military engagement uh, on the Eastern Flank. Uh, and uh, from Poland's perspective, NATO is the prime framework, of course, for collective defense and for developing mili military uh, cooperation with a strong US uh, leadership complemented by uh, enhanced uh, bilateral or regional uh, uh, ties um, and uh, with strong investments in national defense, which Poland and other Eastern Plan countries uh, are currently uh, starting. Um, with regard to Germany, um, the feeling is, is that uh, of the official Berlin uh, does not really understand what is at stake strategically and that um, our security, the security of the Eastern Flank depends uh, on uh, the outcome of this war. And it seems that um, uh, the SPD-led government uh, does not want a Ukraine that is winning the war and Russia that is completely losing this war uh, out of fears of Russia going for nuclear options or uh, out of fear of Russia imploding. And both scenarios um, are deemed too risky in Berlin and are linked to the sphere of confrontation uh, with Russia over uh, European security. Uh, and uh, this uh, makes uh, Germany looks abroad as a very reluctant European player, reluctant uh, European uh, ally uh, that uh, is made to do more only by really heavy pressure uh, domestically and uh, from the allies. And uh, we are faced right now with almost two months of, uh, of uh, controversial domestic discussions uh, about more military uh, support uh, for Ukraine um, on part of Germany. And what are the conclusions um, and more so uh, from this? Uh, I think that uh, the doubts uh, are about Germany's reliability as an ally uh, have grown. Uh, this uh, German fear of confrontation with Russia has had a strong impact on Polish thinking about uh, developing security and defense policy. Um, I think the feeling is that don't count on Germany. Uh, uh, even, it is, if, even if it is the biggest ally in our neighborhood, Germany will, of course, follow, but with a strong uh, U.S. Uh, leadership, with uh, difficult pol uh, political discussions, with military problems. Um, and uh, the conclusion is, is that uh, all this needs to be taken into consideration when shaping also uh, military uh, cooperation uh, on the eastern flank. And uh, this, if this needs, is to be changed, uh, Germany needs to uh, stop being a la uh, laggard and move to uh, becoming a co-leader in uh, responding uh, to the Russian uh, threat uh, as we see it uh, right now in Europe, because I uh, strongly believe that we do need uh, a more uh, more German, Polish, US cooperation on the Eastern flank. And I think we do need push also Germany, uh, both from Poland and from the US, uh, simply to do more, to engage more and to be more proactive instead of being reactive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not my place to uh, take a position either in favor of or against the German government, but I think if, if we had um, a German uh, government official uh, here, I imagine they might say a couple of things in response to the points you've made. And one is that um, that Germany has done qualitatively um, uh, things uh, in support of Ukraine that are uh, quite similar uh, and in fact aligned with the, um, those of its major allies, uh, including the United States, if you look at things like provision of, of uh, heavy weapons and so forth. But 
those decisions have come later. But I think what I hear you what I hear you saying is that this is not just a question of pace and of communications or the kind of strategic messaging that comes from Germany. You're saying that there is a Polish that that official Poland is reaching a judgment um, that uh, that Germany is not is not reliable despite everything that it has uh, done recently. Uh, I think that the reading of, of the of Berlin now and, and this war uh, and the Russian invasion of Ukraine is that uh, Germany, uh, for various reasons and for strong fears of uh, confrontation with Russia, uh, will not be a leader of uh, European uh, NATO allies uh, with regard to uh, in the collective defense efforts. And therefore, the US presence uh, in uh, Europe on the eastern flank is essential and is needed to shape cooperation uh, with Germany. And I think uh, there, there has been also uh, strong hopes uh, regarding the Zeitenwende speech of the German Chancellor, uh, which uh, were seen afterwards uh, unfulfilled. And Poland, Warsaw has been um, uh, watching uh, very uh, skeptically the, the, the discussions uh, in Germany. And from this, these discussions, uh, uh, the conclusion it takes is that uh, one, uh, the, the Eastern flank, Poland, uh, needs to cautiously shape uh, military cooperation, cooperation in security and defense uh, with Germany. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm sure that gives us a, a point that we will come back to in discussion. So thank you. I'm going to turn now uh, to Dr. Daniel Fiat. Um, I, I'd like you to give us a kind of Europe-wide uh, perspective, uh, it, in particular, the European Union, which was working on a, um, uh, the so-called strategic compass uh, work that had gone on for a couple of years before the, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, and, and so there were some changes, I think, that came in that document at the end. But um, I, I think that's, you know, that, that raises the, uh, the point, you know, to what degree are the uh, assumptions and the strategic conclusions uh, shifting um, at the European Union level? And, uh, and, and how, do you, uh, how do you assess that at this point? Uh, th thanks very much, Jeff, uh, and it's a, a real pleasure. So th thanks for the invitation and a real pleasure to share the, uh, the virtual stage uh, with all the fellow speakers. Um, let me begin maybe with uh, kind of an observation uh, that might be useful, and that is to say that I think uh, some of the discussions we're having at the EU level almost mimic uh, some of the discussions uh, being had in Germany on a domestic level, uh, because indeed there's a kind of grappling uh, between the so-called, you know, Venus and Mars views of the world uh, is also having, I would say, an impact at the EU level. So also what type of actor does the EU want to become uh, in the years ahead? Also, what type of security challenges does the EU have to try and make a contribution to, uh, to as well? Now, that's not an easy process. I think in the German context, clearly there are challenges in that discussion. But at the EU level, it also means that we have, I think, especially since the uh, Russia's um, uh, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, we've also seen other states. I mean, Justina just mentioned the Polish case as well, but it's certainly true that we've had uh, Central Eastern European uh, states who have become also much more assertive uh, in the framing of EU defense. And I think that uh, that's quite healthy. Um, a second point I'd like to make is that maybe it was really fortunate for the EU uh, to have had this discussion, and a lot of you will probably recall this, uh, the kind of back and forth uh, between President Macron uh, and the then Defence Minister um, uh, Annegret kramp karrenbauer on the theological debate about strategic autonomy, right? There was a lot of ink wasted, a lot of uh, interviews given, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm actually quite happy that we had that theological discussion before the Russians invaded Ukraine, because I think one of the things that that um, conflict has really uh, enabled at the EU level is a bit more clear-eyed thinking uh, about some of the challenges that we face. So not so much having philosophical debates about the direction of EU security and defense, but in practice, what tangible contributions uh, we can make at the EU level. And I think we have a number of cases already there, not least in terms of the sanctions, so the very hard hitting sanctions, but also in the way that we've adapted some of our existing tools, such as the European Peace Facility, where we can use EU money uh, essentially to fund 
includes the transfer of lethal equipment uh, and weapons to the Ukrainian armed forces. Now, the context which you raised in your initial question is really interesting because indeed the compass process itself uh, began with the German presidency actually um, in June 2020. Uh, and in that period, we were already dealing with some, I would say, fundamental questions. Um, I don't think it's entirely fair to say uh, that Russia's invasion of Ukraine was the moment when NATO and European allies suddenly switched back to collective defense discussions. I think that had actually been brewing for some years, uh, and not least you can probably recall the discussions uh, surrounding the evacuation from Afghanistan, uh, also the earlier discussions about intervention or not into Syria, where there was really a, a kind of redirection within NATO, also within the EU, also in individual countries, about, well, what is the relevance also of the kind of crisis management or expeditionary um, uh, mission uh, kind of philosophy now? And that was definitely reinforced, of course, by Russia's invasion. So I think uh, in that period, the EU was not only drafting a document, but it was also trying to relearn uh, or learn even from the very uh, beginning uh, what type of world it was in. Now, the uh, HRVP, the High Representative Borrell, uh, likes to speak about the fact that Europe is in danger. And uh, I think probably no one would disagree with that. But I think one of the uh, deep, um, let's say, points of agreement in that document, in the strategic compass, is that Europe has no choice now but to accept that it is in, a, in an environment uh, of strategic competition. And all of those really uh, maybe uncomfortable concepts like great power competition, uh, like the return of war to Europe, like the fact that we have to invest more in our defense, like the fact that we have to invest in capabilities. Uh, conversations, by the way, which we've been dancing around, I would say, for the last two decades, uh, they become even more serious today. And I think that that kind of general push has been behind the compass. Now, you're also correct to say, Jeff, that um, even within the last few weeks, because of Russia's invasion, uh, there was a kind of a last minute, um, let's say, reinvestment in the text to make sure that especially the point raised about Russia's invasion of Ukraine also being an existential threat to some EU members and to some NATO allies, that also had to be underlined. And that probably wasn't made very strong at, the big, at least before the invasion. So that, that's a kind of catch up game. The second point I would say is about how the compass is framed more generally. So if we accept that for the next decade or so, we're going to be a union that is having to grapple with this issue of strategic competition, whether that be Russia or China, uh, we need to upgrade the way we think about defense and also how we invest in our defense. Now, for the last two decades, especially for those who are very familiar with the, with the field, we've been talking about common security and defense policy, and that has been largely framed as crisis management, um, which only takes you so far in a, a period where there's less appetite for that type of uh, intervention, I would say. So I think the compass quite usefully then draws upon EU tools uh, and added value of the EU in other areas. For example, uh, countering hybrid threats, I think is really important, uh, ensuring Europe's cyber defense. Uh, and also, I, I guess, um, uh, investing more in being able to protect what we call the so-called strategic domains or those domains that enable our defense and security, both in the EU and NATO. And I would refer, for example, to uh, the, the fact that we need to maintain open seas and oceans, the fact that we need to protect our space infrastructure, the fact that we need to invest in our cyber defense, air security, et cetera. These are all concepts which the EU was not really talking about even uh, five years ago, even uh, after the global strategy even. Uh, so it's been, a, I would say, uh, quite a big update. The other point that I would like to, to make as well, and I'll end on this as well, um, is the real emphasis now being placed on the importance of investment and capability development. Those two issues are areas where I think the EU can make a substantial contribution. Also, it is a contribution, I think, to both EU-NATO cooperation too. Uh, and it means that I think in the next few months, uh, we will see a much more intensive engagement in trying to get capabilities in place as soon as possible uh, to meet the challenge of Russia. And that will have a spillover effect. I think some of our speakers, other speakers have uh, referred to this already, but let's just say in the next uh, few months, a decision is taken to base troops permanently or NATO presence permanently uh, in the Eastern flank. 
Well, that will also have implications for the European Union uh, in terms of how we think about military mobility, in terms of how we fund military mobility. So we're in a learning process, I guess, but the really good thing about the compass, uh, in addition to all of the deliverables that it spells out, and there are about 72 deliverables that the EU has to work on, I think it's a good basis, not only for the EU itself to become more serious, but it's also a good basis for EU and NATO to look a bit eye to eye on some of these really fundamental issues that we will have to come to. And the, the overall logic, I guess, is also understanding the point that was made right at the beginning, uh, which is that within the transatlantic context, Europeans have no room now. There's no way in which we can shy away from the discussion about us having to materially improve our contribution um, to the transatlantic alliance. So that's capabilities, that's spending, uh, and that's also engaging in areas where maybe the EU has an added advantage over NATO in some domains. That's also working with NATO in those areas where the alliance has an added advantage as well. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, it's a basis also for unity. I'll stop there, Jeff, and happy to take further questions. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Daniel. And um, before we take uh, questions from our viewers, uh, I see several uh, quite interesting questions already popping up, and I look forward to turning to those. But I want to give our panelists an opportunity to respond uh, to some of the some of the big issues that have been raised in this opening round. Um, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll turn first uh, to you, Christoph. Um, anything that you want to pick up and, uh, and, and move forward or uh, express uh, express a view on that you've heard so far? Well, um, um, I think this is, if I may say so, a, a very interesting, very good, good panel. All the, all the uh, relevant questions from my perspective have been, have been raised. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Justina um, uh, directed her criticism directly to, to Germany. Um, now I'm, I'm uh, retired. I don't have anything to do with the government anymore. Um, so not for me to defend uh, the government, but maybe to explain, you know, to explain um, where, where do we come from? You know, first, um, we come from a country that was the outcast in Europe. We were a country that said no, never again, you know, German military. We, the Munich Security Conference started 60 years ago by actually having our American friends over and teaching us Germans, yes, it's a good thing that Germany has an army again. It's a good thing that Germany should now be a member of NATO for many years. You know, our, when it, uh, reunification, our, our, there was a prominent friend who said, well, we love Germany so much, we want to have two of them. Um, and uh, um, so there was a lot of hesitation because of German history. And, and I mean, we, I think we really dealt with our history um, by, um, you know, the um, important for Poland, all the recognition of the post Second World War borders um, by Willy Brandt going to Warsaw and, and kneeling there. And, uh, you know, we, we killed, Germany killed 27 million um, 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 people living on the, in the space of the former Soviet Union. And for us, to come back, you know, we have a very strong peace movement. You know, we, we, we know what has happened in the name of Germany. To come back now, to build up a military, to um, um, actually then, then um, you know, be ready to fight, to, to think about fighting Russia, having Russians again confront German tanks, you know, this is nothing that comes easy. And so we have to fight for this. We have to, um, you know, and I'm, I'm, totally on your line. I think we have to take the lead. We have to be much more, but you have to understand where we come from. The Social Democratic Party, the party of Helmut, uh, of, of um, uh, Billy Brandt is, is a party that stands for this peace. And But at the same time, and there I'm totally with you, uh, I just mentioned it, um, the SPD is also the party of Helmut Schmidt, who was the one who got the U.S. government to uh, to get to um, the, the the readiness to deploy the Pershing missile, the double track NATO decision was a Helmut Schmidt SPD decision. So there is um, there is some hope um, for you there, um, uh, Justina. What I'm what I'm preaching at is actually that we also take the lead much more on on military. When it comes to political debate, you know, remember um, the first uh, uh, Russia invasion. At the time, it was um, um, uh, Angela Merkel who took the lead also in the Minsk agreements. Um, she took the lead in the European Union to get everybody on board with tough sanctions. 
not tough enough, but you know, to get everybody on board. And uh, so we have been um, doing this on solidarity. I mean, we have, um, I've, in our house, we have um, Ukrainian refugees. We have, um, you know, 350,000 who do a fantastic job, but let's recall 2015, where Germany took so many refugees from Syria on board. Uh, I don't remember how many Poland uh, took at that time. Um, but, you know, we, we show our solidarity, we assume responsibility, and we just have to, I always quote a, a countryman of your, Alex Sikorsky, who is actually, and he's a very important witness in Germany, who is asking Germany to take the lead. So, and then tells all those who say, well, the Polish neighbors have had enough of us in our military, they don't want us. We have to do more. And um, I think it's good also that what you are saying as somebody who has been working with Germany, I think our friends also have to be ready to speak out as you do it and remind our government, yes, you have to follow up. You have to follow through on what Chancellor Scholz said. He said the right thing, but he has to drag along a party that has a totally different um, different uh, um, um, history. You now, our the, the, the leader of the SPD parliamentary group blocked until the end of last year that Germany buys armed drugs. You know, and, and we had a huge problem to get the, um, uh, you know, nuclear participation into the coalition agreement. So, you know, you have to understand where we come from. But you are totally right. We are doing this domestically to try to get the government on track. We, we push them every day to do what you ask us to do. Back to you. Thanks so much. Um, Heather, any uh, additional observations? Just, uh, just a quick uh, finger. Uh, what Justina said about there is no going back. The European security order that we're talking about historically is not there. Now we have to build the new. And I think, Christoph, I think there's an enormous amount of appreciation of the challenges, the difficulties. We're seeing that in real time publicly, of the, the German discourse right now. I call it the battle of the letters right now. I'm keeping up with the letters of, you know, but that, but that's important, but I'm not interested, I have to say in the Willy Brandt conversation, I wanna know who are the leaders in Germany today to shape that future? Is that Michael Hort? Is that uh, Anton uh, Hofreiter? Is that Annalena Baerbach? These are the new voices that have to help shape that vision because the past is gone. We have to create the future and we can working on those values and all those principles that allowed Germany to reunify. So I think this is about the future, not dwelling in the past as difficult as that past is. That's where I think we need to put our energy, but that debate is going to be incredibly difficult, robust. The economic consequences of German decision-making are going to be uh, catastrophic. The political, the military buildup, this is huge. And I don't want to underestimate that in any way, but I want to focus our energies if we can on building that future, because I think that's what the Ukrainian people need. That's what uh, the transatlantic security relationship needs. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, Justina? Uh, sure, uh, thank you. Uh, I fully agree uh, uh, with uh, Christoph Heusken. Uh, Germany uh, needs to do their homework, needs to do their debates, but the problem is, and I fully understand uh, that the pace is slower than, uh, than we would like it to be, but the problem is that uh, we don't have that much time for Germany, you know, to, to do their homework in the pace they are, uh, you're doing that now. And uh, therefore, um, the, the reluctancy I express that is here in Warsaw uh, about engaging more with Germany, although many uh, think this is crucial and extremely important to get Germany on board, uh, to get Germany uh, be engaged on the eastern flank to a larger extent that it is uh, right now uh, to work together with the US to shape this cooperation also with the Baltic states also possibly with Sweden and Finland uh, and I'm a strong proponent of that in the Polish debate but I must say this is uh, increasingly difficult uh, facing the the difficult discussions uh, and debates and this reluctance and uh, and support, especially on the military side uh, of Ukraine. And why do we um, uh, expect uh, more from Germany? Because Germany is the biggest economic power in Europe, is the biggest, one of the biggest European allies, is the one of the biggest arms ex exporters and have 
uh, at the same time tremendous problems in sending more uh, weapons uh, to Ukraine. But the most important thing is that Germany is an incredibly important country in shaping European policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia and vis-a-vis -vis Eastern neighborhood. And it's uh, and uh, the Russian perspective on how Europe uh, will react in future uh, on um, uh, towards some Russian uh, aggressive moves against Eastern flank um, depends largely on how Russia perceives uh, your policies now and how Russia will perceive, uh, will think, what will you do in the future? And therefore, this is so important uh, that uh, you have this debate, but you have also a change, a substantial change uh, in policy. Yeah. Thank you. And, you know, one of the things that strikes me is that uh, for the last several years, so much of the transatlantic security discussion has been a question of American expectations and American demands of uh, Germany, of other European allies. And what I think this uh, current crisis illuminates is that um, this is because, in fact, the Biden administration has taken a very, uh, a very careful and soft uh, approach uh, in public toward uh, toward its allies, especially the the larger the larger allies in Europe. Instead, this is about how Germany takes account of the expectations of its European partners, uh, not just of uh, the big transatlantic one. Um, uh, Daniel, any last word before we turn to Q&A? Yeah, no, just very quickly, and also to underline what you just said, uh, Jeff, about uh, what's interesting is that there is such a dynamic internal European debate now about this question of responsibility. Um, I'm not sure how it's perceived uh, in Washington, but it must be quite interesting that the Europeans are, are making exactly the same cases and points made by uh, the US for so many years, but it may be in a with a, with a European uh, flavor to it. Um, just one, one observation I would make, and I think actually Justina um, uh, made this point, and it will be really crucial going ahead, but Europeans at the moment do not have an agreed idea uh, of the implications maybe of the ending of this war, if we can put it that way, or, or even the length of this war. And I say that because... Um, I sometimes get the impression that policy decisions are almost conditioned by an expectation of how the conflict may end. Uh, and just one example of this, which I think relays back into discussions about defense spending and capability development, um, I'm seeing the narrative start um, or, or, or take root, uh, which is that because Russia's military looks so severely weakened um, by its uh, uh, interve intervening in Ukraine, that somehow that should serve as a reason for Europeans not to invest in their defense uh, or not to increase in their defense spending and capabilities. I am of the view that that is such a wrong and short-sighted view of the world. Uh, but again, it does come back to this challenge of, I'm not sure Europeans yet have an agreed idea of how they see Russia as an actor, what its long-term impulses are, uh, and how we should adjust our strategy accordingly uh, to that. That's going to be a number of years. We have to get it right. But I do hope that our leaders invest in the principal elements, which is more defense spending, more military capabilities, and uh, I think the rest will follow from that. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, we've got some great questions. We're going to turn to those now. Um, Heather, I think we may lose you at, at, at the stroke of the hour, so I'll make sure to get in particular one of these questions in before you have to leave us. The first one I'm going to start with is uh, a question uh, about, uh, about uh, nuclear weapons. Um, the questioner asks um, somewhat provocatively whether Germany should uh, should be thinking about nuclear weapons, but I want to expand this to be, should the role of nuclear weapons in NATO strategy be changing um, in light of the nuclear threats we've been uh, hearing from, uh, from Moscow throughout uh, this war? Um, can I start with you, Christoph? Yes, um, should Germany get uh, uh, nuclear weapons? We, uh, we adhere to the um, to international law, the rules-based international order, and one of the most important is the non-nuclear proliferation treaty, which we uh, um, uh, militantly um, um, subscribe to and defend. Uh, no way. I said earlier how important it was, though, for um, Germany to take the decision, you know, um, to be part of. Uh, you know, the nuclear forces in, in Europe and um, the government has um, committed to buy um, F-35 bombers that replace the old tornado bombers. So it's also a good 
transatlantic uh, initiative. Um, Heather, I hope you appreciate this, and uh, we have to see that the uh, um, that we'll we'll soon sign on the treaty and and we go go ahead. No, on the on the nuclear, I think we have our nuclear strategy, um, and um, um, you know, in, 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 in the um, parameters of the um, uh, of NATO um, um, rewriting of the strategic concept. Um, I don't know if there is a um, addition um, necessary, but what is key is that the role that the nuclear has played during all the time of the Cold War and had actually preserved the longest period of peace in the center of Europe, um, this remains absolutely important uh, for, for us. So uh, we need this. This was the best protection we had, you know, the, the US presence, but also then the, the, the threat of, um, um, of a nuclear. And we have to maintain that there is no, no doubt about this from my, my perspective. Okay. I'll come back and ask the other panelists on the new, if you want to add on the nuclear question, but before Heather has to leave, I want to ask this one. Is there a concern among NATO nations, or I might add, should there be a concern among NATO nations about the political stability of the United States? Well, um, I, I completely understand uh, that question, um, you know, and, and we follow the political stability of, of, of Europe. The French presidential elections was another classic example of uh, paying very close attention to the politics of our, of our NATO allies. Um, what I've seen really over the last several months, um, and again, thanks to Vladimir Putin, we now see extraordinary bipartisan support in Congress for strong military, economic, and humanitarian support to Ukraine, um, as well as stronger resolve of, of you know, ensuring that Russia is weakened and cannot uh, invade another neighbor again. So I think in some ways that we cannot, I cannot tell you, cannot predict the outcome of the midterm elections, nor um, as well. I think we're all leaning forward because we lost Heather there for a moment um, in hopes that we get her back. Um, uh, we, will pause, uh, we, will, we will pause that answer there. Um, but let me ask um, our other panelists. I mean, the United States has been proven to be, I think in this crisis, to use the phrase of the late Madeleine Albright, the ind indispensable nation. It's hard to conceive of this support for Ukraine that has been so effective in helping them defend uh, themselves uh, without the U.S. role. So what does that mean um, uh, for, uh, as, as you look at um, the political future of the United States? Oh, Heather, uh, okay, Heather, we've got you back. So I want to let you- apologize. I apologize, our, our Wi-Fi just went out, I, I apologize. <laughs> Finish that thought before you have to go and then, uh, and, and I'll thank you right now for spending this time with us, it's been terrific. <laughs> You must have thought I clicked myself off and away I went. I apologize. Um, but uh, so, as I said, I, I think we just need to, to continue to strengthen NATO. European NATO allies continue to increase that defense spending, make those contributions and those capabilities. And that is the best answer to American skepticism, if you will, about alliances and about their contribution. I will just one final say thank you, Jeff. This was really a fantastic conversation. We need more of these really important conversations. Uh, I would say, Christoph, I am extremely appreciative uh, of uh, not only, um, again, this is going to be extremely difficult for, for Germany, but the F-35 purchase, um, this 100, you know, 100 billion euro defense fund, this is really significant. And I hope that the United States and Germany can work together on that modernization. I, I hope it is in integral to NATO capabilities. So there is much to celebrate here about where German policy has it ha is going. I think we all know that the timelines, to Justina's point, we cannot wait. Um, our freedom, our defense uh, is, is absolutely at stake. So this is why there's such great urgency. But Jeff, thank you so much. I apologize to all, but hopefully we can continue this important conversation. Thank you. Great, thanks, Heather. Um, we've, got a, we've got a few more minutes. Uh, so I wanna turn back um, to the question we were just uh, addressing and see whether uh, any of our panelists wanna uh, offer uh, views uh, on that uh, more US focused um, issue. 
All right, then we'll come back to the, to the, oh yes. Okay, is that Daniel, you clicked on your microphone. Go ahead, Justina, go ahead. Okay, um, from Polish perspective, uh, I think that uh, Poland, uh, for Poland, the US is, is an indispensable ally, as I mentioned that earlier. Uh, and Poland uh, will try uh, everything to uh, not only keep uh, the US engaged within NATO, which is the most important um, defense alliance for us, but also to uh, uh, enhance uh, Polish US bilateral ties, not only in the military but, uh, realm, but also uh, in the uh, the political aspects and the economic uh, U.S. engagement uh, in Poland, but also in the region. And I think uh, Poland will try, uh, regardless of the administration, to uh, develop this uh, two-track approach uh, to keep uh, the U.S. strongly engaged in NATO and to keep uh, a strong U.S. presence uh, on the eastern flank uh, in Central uh, and Eastern Europe. Very good. Uh, maybe very briefly, uh, just to, just to add to this. I mean, I think there is a sense within the EU that um, that well, the the experiences of the Trump administration were shocking. Um, let me just use that word. Uh, and it has it has dislodged something in the way that um, a number of European states are thinking about. You know, the kind of um, uh, automaticity uh, of that relationship with the US. So I think it's only prudent that Europeans try to develop within NATO and, and the EU uh, the capacity to, to produce their defense, to continue to be uh, credible partners, whatever happens in the transatlantic relationship. The other point to this, of course, is that at the moment, the fact that we have an administration that um, has more of an open ear um, and much more, I would say, cordial relations with the European Union um, has, is also having the effect that we have, it's almost like we have a, a timer uh, on, on our relations. And so that has added to the political effect of leaders investing much more and in a shorter period of time and with more energy uh, into the relationship with Washington at the moment, with the idea that we don't know what's coming uh, further down the line. So we really have to seize on that momentum uh, at the moment. It's working. Uh, I think also it would be interesting to see how the US and the EU develop their defense dialogue as well in the future. But it really is uh, having that positive pressure, I would say, uh, on, on the transatlantic relationship at the moment. Okay, we've got three different, three rough categories of questions remaining that I want to get to. The, the, there's one uh, NATO strategic concept question, one about, uh, I would say, relations in Europe, and then uh, uh, some EU-specific questions. I'm going to take them in that, uh, well, not quite in that order. I'm going to start a question that uh, highlights that we're, we've been talking about Germany, the United States, and Poland uh, in this uh, discussion, and where do the panelists see France's role? Is there no need for a Weimar Triangle anymore? I would just say it's hard to manage uh, too many uh, panelists at once, although I would love to have a French voice on this in this discussion. But maybe I'll start with you, Christophe Hoiskin, because we've just had an, the re-election of President Macron. Uh, and so there is the question of, uh, of Franco-German cooperation and broader, perhaps Weimar, perhaps in other configurations in Europe. How, how do you see uh, that role? Yes. Um... I um, um, have been in several of the Weimar Triangle meetings. There, some went well, some were not that um, uh, constructive. But I continue to believe in this concept, which was, I think, it started with uh, Helmut Kohl on the German side, and uh, I think it is it is very important that we for Poland, Germany, and and France to come together to see things together, because sometimes the aspects, um, the the. You know, perspective things were, were different and um, I hope that after um, now there is a new government formed with Macron being um, again in charge that this aspect of cooperation um, uh, and, and you know it's not um, for its own sake it is because um, of this cooperation that we have to bring in um, you know France to be um, a country that sees uh, what all of, all of the, the, the um, interest um, um, all of the um, conflicts that uh, Justina talked about, the aggression of Russia, and that you know all of Europe is part of this. You remember that it was uh, President Macron who called um, uh, NATO uh, brain dead, 
Um, so and and we know the the history on on, on it. So I think it's very important to draw um, uh, draw France into this debate to have France participate. And I think when you look at the different decisions with regard to the sanctions that have been taken, I think the French government, although in um, although in in uh, um, uh, election campaign was very was was very um, constructive. Um, at the same time. Um, we need to continue to work on, on Europe, on European integration. Um, we all share what has, we all share about the US as the indispensable nation, but um, no matter um, um, who is um, at the helm of in, in Washington, we have listened to what Heather said earlier, also with the need to concentrate on China. There will be moments where European interests are at stake, um, where maybe European defense um, uh, is needed, European forces are needed, where the Americans say, listen, this is now something in your area, we cannot solve all problems. Uh, Balkans, for instance, you know, I mean, we we're very happy 20 years ago, 20, 25 years that the Americans were there. But I would claim for Europe that we have to put our own house in order. And therefore, we also have to have a European defense. But totally agree, I think everybody on this panel, um, no duplication of forces, but we have to have situations where we can do um, without um, uh, without the uh, um, without our um, American friends. I've always always fought this idea of European autonomy and, and strategic autonomy because we are not autonomous. We cannot do without the US. We see it right now without um, you know, the US, we would be in a much weaker stage um, uh, uh, facing, um, facing um, um, uh, Russia. But we do need to do our homework and we need Poland for also to concentrate on, on this. I remember when I was working with Kavi Solana in the early, in the late nine, early 2000s, went to Poland to try to explain how important European security and defense policy was. You know, they almost uh, banned me from, from uh, Poland at the time. I think there is a deeper understanding for this, but you know, for us, for me, it's not a choice. You know, we have to do both, um, and we need France for this. When you say uh, Justina, Germany is a key country, yes, we are. But please remember, European history. If Germany and France don't go in the same direction, this causes uh, problems, huge problems. So we we have to work. So next time, perhaps, uh, Jeff, this is a very good conversation. We get uh, French uh, into onto the the panel. We, we've been blessed to have uh, uh, French voices in previous iterations of this uh, five-part series, um, uh, but I take the point, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, Justina, do you want to add anything on uh, the, on France, and then we'll uh, try to tackle the last two baskets of... Uh, mm, uh, sure. I think that from Polish perspective, uh, military France is extremely capable military power, and uh, France's uh, engagement in enhancing NATO's eastern flank and uh, possibly in the Black Sea uh, region when, where France would like to constantly focus on, on um, enhancing the security of Romania uh, is extremely welcomed. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Poland is very cautious about French attempts to push the discussions about EU strategic autonomy forward. And I think uh, we are both critic, um, um, reluctant uh, uh, towards uh, uh, this idea of EU uh, acquiring or um, transforming into a collective defense uh, alliance. Uh, and I think that politically we are not on the same line. We'll see how the French uh, uh, rhetoric, how the French policy within this um, regard will change or not uh, now with Macron being in, in his uh, second term. Uh, and how, whether it will, uh, France will like to push uh, this idea further, uh, the more uh, the presidential elections uh, in the US uh, will be approaching. This will be, a if, if that happens, that will be a very difficult conversation uh, between Poland and France or the Eastern flank. Uh, but I hope that uh, the recent um, um, moves uh, uh, of uh, Paris within NATO uh, that has been has been very much welcomed and the willingness of Paris uh, to engage more on the eastern flank that that will continue and that there will be some kind of a reassessment uh, of uh, French policies in this respect. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is a NATO question and it has to do with NATO's strategic concept. Um, there are three core tasks NATO has historically defined. Um, 
that is uh, collective defense, um, crisis management, and then uh, partnerships and engagement. The question is, um, does the panel believe that there should be a focus on a fourth core function of resilience, uh, something we see, of course, uh, exemplified uh, in part in Ukraine? Uh, is, should resilience be a fourth core task? Justina, I'll start, Justina, I'll start with you. Um, it's a difficult question because I think that uh, what we have seen uh, last year, resilience ha has been uh, highlighted uh, by the uh, NATO Secretary General and, uh, and, uh, uh, and some NATO documents. Uh, but I do believe that uh, um, resilience is best handled within the EU. The EU has uh, best instruments uh, and uh, uh, ability to improve uh, the resilience of the EU as a whole and uh, uh, contribute to improving uh, the resilience of the uh, individual EU member states and uh, uh, which are NATO uh, member states as well. And resilience has been a topic for the strategic concept, uh, uh, concept as well. Anything to add to that, Christoph Hoiskin? Not, not really. I think resilience is something that belongs to all of, all of the different things. I, I think this is a different, different uh, category. But uh, you know, resilience always sounds very well. Uh, it's a good. <laughs> it's, it's something positive. So <laughs> let's include right, it. right. Um, okay, then I'm going to turn to our basket um, of questions, uh, I'll st and I'll, I'll direct these first to you, Daniel, and then we'll see if others want to comment. But. Uh, there are several questions on uh, the EU dimension. On the one hand, the US-EU dialogue uh, on defense and security. Um, there is a question about whether the, the, the strategic compass measures are sufficient to encourage uh, more coordinated uh, EU spending. Um, uh, there's a question about the crisis management basket um, and its future. Uh, it's probably too much uh, to deal with uh, in, in just a couple of minutes. So I'll let you, Daniel, pick um, what you think should be the most important uh, uh, message coming out uh, on, that, uh, on that topic. Yeah, thanks very much. And then thanks uh, to the audience for the questions. I've, I'll try my best, actually, uh, to get all three of them. But I think on the EU-US dialogue, um, that's just begun. Um, it'd be very interesting to see where it goes and in it specifically uh, in what core topics. I think that there is still some uh, maybe temerity because it's a new kind of uh, setup. Um, but nonetheless, I think there are a lot of issues, especially on the defense industrial side of things, where EU and US uh, can uh, discuss. Keep in mind also that it fits very much within a broader EU-US um, dialogue at the moment, especially on technology and trade uh, too. Now, uh, on the compass and spending, I mean, the compass is a strategy document. Yeah? No strategy document in its own power and in its own right has the ability to take political leaders uh, and their wallets from A to B. Um, so what we need in the next few months and years, of course, is that continued commitment uh, by member states. But I would also just say as well, that one of the uh, interesting things about the compass is that it also prefigures uh, the parallel debate, if I can put it this way, uh, that has emerged out of the Versailles summit that was held earlier um, this year, where in that summit, there was a very direct um, political tasking to the European Commission to come up firstly with an analysis um, of what capabilities we need in Europe today to protect and defend us uh, because of the changed security environment. But also beyond that, uh, quite a difficult discussion, but necessary one, I would say, on how we view uh, the method in which we invest in our defense. Uh, at the moment, we have a defense fund, uh, which has about 8 billion euros. Uh, some could question whether that is uh, up to the challenge, uh, probably not. So we now need to be thinking, and I think the German um, actions have also uh, given us that framework. You know, the 100 billion uh, euro mark is, uh, is something all of us have to aspire to, I guess. Uh, so we have to be thinking about new ways of injecting money uh, into European defence. That will probably mean also more of an emphasis on joint uh, procurement, but it would also mean taking into consideration those capabilities in the short term that will make a, an immediate impact to European defence. Um, and there are many capability areas that we can focus on. So spending big is really important, and I think there is political momentum there to do that. We have to wait and see at the end of this month 
whether there's agreement on this, but at least that's the political ambition. Crisis mm -hmm. management very, very quickly, if I can. Yeah, that paradigm is changing. As I said in, in my initial remarks, there is some reluctance in, in a number of countries about uh, sustaining um, crisis management or intervention or expeditionary intervention, if you want to put it this way. But I think there has been a realization uh, that um, even when you look at the Russia, um, uh, Russia's actions in Ukraine, there may be some fallout um, from that uh, that may hit other areas, very vulnerable areas, not least North Africa, Middle East, and, and also uh, wider than that, which may call for, and I think um, uh, Christoph Huiskin said this as well, uh, where American partners may not want to intervene, but there may be core European interests. Well, that means we have to get rather serious about how we intervene uh, in our crisis management uh, operations. We also have to understand that we're in a very tense political environment where it could be, for example, uh, that Russia may veto certain Euro uh, UN Security Council resolutions, and we rely on those resolutions for intervening, of course, on a legal basis. But what happens in that context if a if a core European interest is at stake and we do not have a UN mandate, uh, do we have the political willingness and capacity to act even under those circumstances? So yeah, crisis management so needs to evolve with those types of really deep um, and serious questions, I would say, not, uh, not to mention all the capability elements uh, related to it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we had one late breaking question, which I thought was concisely formulated. And so I will uh, pose it to Christoph Hoisken. How much time uh, will it take Germany to rebuild uh, the Bundeswehr, um, considering its current conditions? Uh, that will have impact on the US need to bridge uh, in terms of European capability. Well, this is the uh, 100 billion euro question. Um, we have, um, unfortunately, not a very good track record in um, doing the procurement and doing you know, all the armament program, um, then doing that rapidly. And we have um, um, structures in the defense ministry, we have controls by, um, um, by our defense uh, um, committee in the Bundestag. Um, and um, uh, over time, it has been, I must be very frank, a nightmare to see how long this takes. And um, I hope that um, the shock that this Know where we started um, the watershed um, that you mentioned at the beginning. Um, I think we do have a, a lot of people in Germany that um, really now want things to to go uh, fast. Like the, um, actually, at Conley, I think mentioned the head of the defense committee, um, Ms. Strack Zimmermann, who is really pushing day by day and and. Uh, you know, I'm trying to contribute also to the sense of urgency, but there's no guarantee that it will not take long. Um, as I said, the, the track record is bad, but you know, also with, with you guys, you know, pressuring from the outside, mentioning, you know, how the expectations are and, and asking now for, you know, what this, uh, this the, the, the watershed of uh, Scholz to be implemented. We need this, also this pressure from outside and uh, so we'll, we'll do everything so that these, you know, we talked about the F-35, we need this urgently. I mean, these, tor the, these tornadoes that we have, you know, I don't know how long they were able to fly. We need, the, we, we need that. And I hope the urgency is as strong as, you know, we, we feel it here when we, when we have this discussion between us. Thank you so much. We've gone a few minutes over time. I thank everyone for uh, the indulgence. Uh, let me start by uh, thanking, uh, the, our supporters uh, for this series, the US diplomatic missions in Germany. Thanks for that support. It's made all of this possible. Uh, I wanna thank uh, you, our viewers, uh, for the terrific questions and for joining us today. Uh, I wanna thank my colleague, Liz Hoteri, for uh, producing and uh, making this run so, uh, so well. And I wanna thank especially our panelists, uh, Justina Gotkowska, Daniel Fiat, Christoph Hoisken, and Heather Conley, uh, who had to leave a bit early. Thank you so much for contributing to this rich discussion and uh, for these, you know, on these vital issues that are crucial to the shared fate of the transatlantic community. We look forward to having you again with us uh, soon here at AICGS, whether it's in person or online, and uh, wish you all a good rest of the day. Thanks so much. <laughs>